so it's, it's really interesting uh, to hear the talk. Right, so I'm going to do Sky Notes for May, um, starting off with a picture that I took last week and uh, Richard was saying, both Richards were saying that the, the best views come to uh, those people who get up early. Um, uh, last week I was on La Palma um, and this is taken from the, uh, the very top of La Palma um, and this shows uh, Venus here, the um, very thin crescent moon illuminated by Earthshine and the early dawn um, and so that's pretty much what you'll see well you won't see the moon but Venus is, is low at the moment in the morning sky so those of you up uh, around sort of 3 or 4 a.m. when it's getting light look over to the east and you'll see Venus anyway sky notes and I'll start with the exciting object at the centre of the solar system um, Last, last meeting, uh, Peter Meadows gave us a talk on the, uh, the last solar cycle and commented that the, the sun had become fairly inactive and uh, certainly it's living up to that at the moment. This is the continuum SOHO MDI image from this morning. Um, and any activity you can see there is a function of the projector, I think. The, uh, there is some, some granularity, but there are no spots. But what was interesting is shortly after Peter gave his talk at the last meeting, saying that activity had died away, we actually had one of the largest spot groups that we, we've had for a long time, um, which I'll show you that in a sec. So the sun, the sun is currently in Taurus. If you look at the um, uh, coronagraph image in Soho, uh, you'll see the nice familiar pattern of the Hyades here, so that's Aldebaran uh, and the Hyades pattern, that's, that's where the sun is. Um, anyway, yes, back to the sunspot, we had this, this really nice large group just shortly after the last meeting in early April. Um, we received a lot of photographs of that. Um, and that kind of, uh, in, I think, encouraged people that maybe there was a bit more activity, but uh, since then the sun has become very, very quiet again. Um, a few images, this, this one recently from Ron Johnson, um, showing a, a relatively small a active area. That's pretty much what solar observers are, are having to get used to at the moment. Um, and there's currently an observer's challenge um, from the uh, solar section director, Lynn Smith, um, talking about observing the sun at uh, solar minimum at the moment on the web page. So if you go to our web page and have a look at that observer's challenge um, and see if you can participate in that. Of course, uh, things get better if you uh, can use monochromatic light and this is a really nice uh, image from uh, Carl Baron. Uh, in hydrogen alpha, um, just showing an incredible amount of detail on the sun's surface. So the way of getting through that, uh, that long minimum that's coming up is, is to invest into, in some hydrogen alpha equipment or monochromatic equipment and, and start looking in those wavelengths because the sun's always interesting there. Um, of course the effects of the sun still being felt, we've still got aurorae around or at least uh, uh, they're not at the high, high level that they have been but they're still going on reasonably well. Um, this is an image from Denis Bozinski up in Tarbet Ness, he's at a, a latitude of about 58 degrees north. Um, so basically at this time of the year things are getting too light for him to see uh, aurorae but this was back at the end of April. But in fact a few days ago there was an alert that went out from the Aurora section and Aurora was seen as far south as, um, as southern England and this is actually a, an image by Mary Spicer from northern Oxfordshire. Um, the yellow there isn't the Aurora, that's, uh, that's light pollution, but you can see that there's a a clear purple glow in the sky and in fact Mary um, posted a, a quite nice time lapse that showed that glow moving so it's definitely auroral activity. But of course for all of us at this time of year the skies are getting probably too bright now for us to see much in the way of auroral activity um, uh, at least in the kind of hours away from midnight and so what people are looking for more uh, at the moment is noctilucent clouds. We're entering the noctilucent cloud season. As far as I know there haven't been any reports from the UK yet of uh, NLC but there was a nice report uh, last week from Denmark. I don't know how well this comes out on the projector but this is a really nice 
a picture by Adrian Modi from um, Urdrop Beach in Denmark, uh, which is in northern Denmark, looking north, looking at uh, noctilucent cloud. So certainly at the moment, um, if it's clear through the evening and you've got a north-facing window to look through, uh, check it regularly to see if there's any NLCs. Um, we will issue uh, an e-bulletin if any NLCs are, uh, uh, are found, so make sure that your email address is registered with the BAA for, for e-bulletins. Um, in fact, around this time of year, I, I tend to leave an old uh, DSLR camera with an with a intervalometer on it just running out of a north-facing north window of the house, uh, just running overnight, just in case there are uh, any NLC in the early hours of the morning. I got a couple of displays last year that way. Uh, but NLC is certainly worth looking out for. Um, of course, uh, we have the, the moon that sometimes spoils the dark skies but uh, sometimes actually gives us something really interesting to look at in, in summer. Um, the full moon uh, coming up in, in June on June the 9th um, and then we've got the next uh, new moon period around, around the end of June. Um, you'll notice there are a few full moons here um, that sort of are, they're generally early in the month. The, um, the August the 7th one there um, is a few days before the peak of the Perseid maximum. So Perseid meteors which, are, which reach their maximum about 12th of August. Uh, we've got a waning gibbous moon at that time. Uh, Bill Leatherbarrow, director of the BAA Lunar Section, sent me this rather nice image taken by Clyde Foster in South Africa um, of um, what's this bright crater, ray crater? Aristarchus. Aristarchus, that's right, and Schroeter's Valley here. So, um, really nice high resolution image uh, taken with the, the, one of the ASI webcams, and the ASI webcams seem to be very, very popular these days amongst planetary images, as you'll see in a minute for some of the planetary images. Um, okay, so going through the night then, starting off in the western sky around 10 pm uh, local time, it's beginning to get dark. So 10 pm BST is 2100 UT. Um, We've got the sort of constellations, uh, at the moment we've got the moon, um, something like first quarter moon, and uh, towards the south we've got Jupiter. Looking further around from west to south, it's dominated really by Jupiter at the moment in the evening sky. But there is something else to look at there, so if you actually look up here, we've got uh, Corona Borealis, um, and of course the famous variable star are Corona Borealis, which pretty much every sky notes I've given for the last five years, I've shown the light curve of our core bore, and amazingly it has now struggled back up from its very, very long minimum, um, up to about, uh, what is it now, about somewhere between seven and eight, Still not as bright as it can get, uh, but at least it seems to have recovered mostly. So um, early evening with binoculars, it's worth just having a quick look in Corona Borealis. Have a look at our Corona Borealis. It should be fairly easy to pick up now in binoculars. Uh, who knows what it's going to do next? Of course, Jupiter is dominating the evening sky at the moment and it's moving south gradually. So like many of the planets, um, take the opportunity now to, to observe it before it moves further and further south. Um, this is a, a rather nice image by Martin Lewis of St Albans, uh, again using an ASI colour camera. Uh, Andy Lee, again using an ASI 224, as I say it seems to be the, the cameras that planetary images use nowadays. Um, showing a very prominent red spot. I, I, I don't know, I mean I've, I've looked at Jupiter visually and, and I think images tend to oversaturate the colours and, and, and I would say that this is kind of rather, rather redder, certainly redder than you would see visually, but um, the red spot is quite prominent at the moment. Um, if you want to see it, have a look in the handbook for the longitude of the central meridian. And, and select your observation times when the, the red spot's actually going to be on the hemisphere that you're observing. Here's a nice one, by, or pair by David Arditi. The projector is kind of 
whiting these out. It's, it's a lot better on the side screens. Um, but this is actually to break, break the ASI thing. This is with a point grey flea camera. Um, this is showing which moon is that on the limb, David? Ganymede. Okay. Um, and David is using one of these dispersion correctors so that as the, as the planets are getting lower, differential refraction makes imaging them more and more difficult, uh, difficult to do. And these dispersion correctors appear to be quite effective at actually reducing that dispersion and improving the quality of the image. So these are both uh, in infrared um, and they're using, it says here derotation, so is this using WinDupos to do, yeah, to do the stacking? Yeah, so um, I, unfortunately I haven't got any images of it, but there was also recently reported uh, an impact flash on Jupiter. Uh, yeah. So, so with, with the increase of a number of people these days who are taking uh, videos of, of the planets, particularly Jupiter, to, uh, to stack for images, there is an increasing number of these impact flashes being detected and because there are so many people doing the imaging they, they often, they're often a confirmation so I think as you said there were at least two weren't there so it's definitely a confirmed impact flash um, the kind of resolution that people are getting is pretty impressive as well so this is one of Martin's uh, images of Callisto where he's comparing the image he's got there with, um, with a simulated image from Windupos and there's, there's definitely correlations in surface features there so on an object that's kind of barely an arc second in diameter actually getting surface features is quite extraordinary and I think what Richard was showing earlier as well in terms of the uh, potential volcano on Venus it just shows how amazing it is these days amateurs can still do incredible things with imaging and even with all the spacecraft in orbit around these planets and all of the professional work that goes on amateurs can still make a, a huge contribution to, um, to the understanding of these objects. This is a rather quirky picture that I picked up off the, um, the members pages on the VAA website um, you'll often see pictures of the International Space Station going across the moon or the sun um, this is the ISS actually travelling past Jupiter um, so basically uh, it's a set of uh, six exposures overlaid uh, with Jupiter down there and the ISS whizzing, whizzing past um, so lo lots of interesting ways that you can get the ISS into your images if you, um, if you think ahead and look on the websites to predict these transits uh, and of course if you want to do high resolution imaging of the ISS actually having it pass by something that, uh, that, that, that is close to somewhere that you can actually point your telescope makes it a lot easier to find it and be ready when it goes past but rather well, nice image that I don't think I've seen anything s similar to that before uh, there was last year or some, something somebody actually posted some images of the ISS actually transiting over Saturn uh, but they turned out to be I think Dam Damien Peach's image of Saturn with some pictures of the space station pasted on in front um, yes and of course we've got the Juno spacecraft currently orbiting around Jupiter John Rogers has um, got a good web page on our website about that and if you're interested in, in what the Juno spacecraft's been doing uh, it's definitely worth going to that uh, web page and reading the report there. So as we go around a bit more towards midnight the, the Milky Way is rising so we've got the northern Milky Way in Cygnus uh, which if you've got a reasonably dark sky um, you should be able to see and then right down into the southern Milky Way going through Scutum, Sagittarius which is where Saturn is currently living so this rather nice picture by Martin Griffiths from the Brecon Beacons shows the northern part of the Milky Way over their observatory, the Brecon Beacon Observatory um, and one of the nice things of summer nights, even the light summer nights is that the Milky Way later on gets high enough up that even from reasonably uh, light polluted sites you can actually see the Milky Way which is, is not a, a common thing from certainly where I live um, and there are a couple of uh, supernovae, interesting supernovae that you can see around that time of night now this one is uh, 
was discovered by Patrick Wiggins, it's the brightest supernova that's around at the moment, it's about 13th magnitude or so, it's in a rather nice galaxy, um, and uh, it's a galaxy which actually, interestingly, I was looking up which constellation this galaxy falls in, this is NGC 6946, and all of the, the sources said Cepheus Cygnus, and I thought, that's a bit odd, why is that? I mean, can't they decide which, which constellation it's in? It's actually the border of Cepheus and Cygnus, actually runs right through the middle of this galaxy. So it really is, half of it's in Cepheus and half of it's in Cygnus. Um, now that was taken with uh, Dennis's C14 up in Port Mahomet. But uh, Nigel Evans, who was in La Palma with me last week, actually had a 100mm lens and he actually managed to image it with a DSLR and a 100mm lens, which is pretty good. It shows how good the dark skies are there. But uh, there it is uh, in the galaxy, 100mm f4. So this is with an aperture of effectively 25mm. Um, he's managed to image that supernova. Um, there's another supernova around at the moment. This is Ron Arbor's supernova. I think it's his 45th, is it 45th? 45. So this is a very unusual supernova for Ron. Generally, Ron discovers supernovae that are invisible to mere mortals because they're so close to the centre of the galaxy that you have to have a precisely focused telescope to actually see them. But this one is actually uh, in a rather nice, pretty galaxy and it's uh, away from the, the central bulge. Um, so this is also, and it's also in a very nicely positioned place, it's in Ursa Major. Um, so if you've got a, a, an imaging system, um, it's about 17th magnitude at the moment, but a, a nice supernova and congratulations to Ron uh, for discovering that. He's, he's certainly kind of continuing to, to build up his total of supernovae. Uh, this is an image that Martin took of it with one of the eye telescope telescopes showing the really nice structure in that spiral galaxy and the supernova itself. So anyway, back to the, the naked eye view. So around about midnight from the UK, if you're out in the country and the moon's out of the way, even with the sky being fairly bright, you should be able to see the star clouds of Sagittarius. This is the, the famous teapot, it's called here. And in really dark sites, you can see uh, the bright central part of our galaxy here, which is the steam coming out of the teapot and, uh, and Saturn. And in fact, as I say, I was in La Palma last week and I took this picture. This is a 60 second exposure with a 14 millimeter lens showing exactly that region. A little bit further south than we can see, but there's the teapot with the steam coming out. That's Scorpius, the sting of the scorpion. And Saturn is right in the middle of those star clouds there. So from the UK, Saturn is really low at the moment. But despite that, a number of observers have been able to get fairly decent images. This is um, a couple of examples, one from Andy Lee and one from Chris Dole. I think they're taken on the, almost exactly the same time. Um, the, wings are the rings are really nicely tilted at the moment, pretty much wide open. Um, I was looking visually a couple of nights ago and um, despite the fact the seeing wasn't brilliant you, you, could, you could in my telescope see the Cassini division but it, it, you know, the, the view is not as good as it would be if the planet were higher up but it's still worth, still worth looking at. It's always a, a pretty planet to look at and fairly easy to find basically about due south low in the sky at midnight. So on to comets, um, Richard Miles mentioned the, the fact that uh, comet section directors maybe have got a curse and end up leaving office under mysterious circumstances. Um, hopefully not because of this. This is, this is the, really the one comet that we've got in the sky at the moment that's reasonably bright. This is uh, Comet Johnson, C2015 V2. It's been around for a long time. It's been around really since January and Feb or in February. It's currently moving south quite rapidly, moving towards its perihelion. It's brightening slowly, but it's going to become more and more difficult for us to observe as it moves south. But at the moment it's still quite high up, around about midnight, due south, moving down past... Um, um, yes, that's Boötes, isn't it? So it's, it's moving past uh, Arcturus in Boötes, down into Virgo. 
I've got a few pictures of it here, of uh, drawings. So this is a drawing by Paul Abel. Really nice actually to receive drawings of comets because most of the time I, I get images and it's nice to, to see a drawing and what people actually see with their eyes through a telescope because images really do tend to, to pick up very faint detail. Um, so this is the, the, basically the inner part of uh, the coma of, of this comet. Probably at the moment it's about 8th magnitude something like that. It's reasonably, reasonably bright and certainly easy enough to see from a dark site in a, in a small telescope. Uh, this is a picture of it I took last week. This is a, a field of view 3.5 by 2.5 degrees. It's got a fairly prominent dust tail. This green here is characteristic of the gas emission from the coma of the comet and you might just about be able to detect there's a kind of faint faintish tail in that direction as well. Um, very difficult to see, possibly better on the monitors. Um, that's um, that's a, a, an in-plane dust train that we're seeing behind the comet. There's also a very faint ion tail which doesn't show up on this. Um, so this was the, from the really really dark skies of La Palma. This was from on a mountain top in La Palma and then Peter Carson got a much better picture from South End. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm doing wrong really um, but yeah this is Peter's excellent picture of the same comet um, from, from the South End mountain top that he lives on uh, again showing the dust tail there and the, and the dust trail off at a, a rather funny angle um, but this, this comet's definitely worth observing it's going to be around for a while yet uh, it's brightening up it's the most interesting comet that we currently have in the night sky Anyway, I, I'm just going to do a, a quick health warning now on a comet which may make it into the, into the media in the next few weeks and I just want to make sure that you don't fall for what some people might say. This is a comet that the PANSTARS survey telescope discovered about a week ago. Um, it, it's a cometary object. Um, initial initial indications were that it was in a very odd orbit but then recently there's been some more astrometry particularly uh, some astrometry from Peter Bertwistle uh, and I got some astrometry last night as well um, so the orbit now even though it's still fairly uncertain we, we can say something about the orbit we, th this comet is about currently magnitude 19 but it's 16 AU from the Earth so it's a very very long way away um, it's, in a, it's in a highly elongated orbit which might be parabolic or it might be an orbit with a period of about 140 years or so we don't really know yet but what we do know is that it will come to perihelion sometime in 2023 and that the perihelion distance is about 1.7 AU so perihelion distance is outside the orbit of the Earth it's outside the orbit of Mars um, but it must be a fairly big object to be 19th magnitude at 16 AU and depending on what assumptions you make it might reach magnitude 2 or 3 in 2023 or it might not <laughs> um, the other thing about it which we do know for sure is that it's in a highly inclined orbit. It's, about, or in, it's inclined about 90 degrees, about 80, what's the inclination? 86, 87 degrees, 88 degrees to the ecliptic. And it so happens that it will be at its best when it's far south of the ecliptic. So we see it for years, basically it's in Draco at the moment, we'll see it for years hanging around in Draco, gradually getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And then for a short period it goes down south will we'll reach its best visible from the southern hemisphere uh, and then go back again now there is lots of speculation online and this will almost certainly be picked up by the media at some point about the fact this could be a really spectacularly bright comet in five years time uh, that, that the nucleus is possibly 100 to 120 kilometers in diameter which is hail box sized um, all kinds of stuff well it, all I can say is it's a very interesting comet it's been discovered a long way out 
but we have absolutely no idea how bright it's going to be when it comes into the inner solar system. At the moment, even the orbital arc is quite short and we don't really know whether it's a periodic comet with an orbital period of 150 years or so, or in a, in a um, parabolic orbit. So we'll, we'll know more about the orbit in the next few weeks or so, but what we won't know anything about is how bright it's going to be, and we won't know that for years yet. So if you do really read anything in the media about massive comet discovered beyond the orbit of Saturn will become a, a massive object in 2023, then don't believe it. <laughs> it's an interesting object though, this is a picture I took of it last night, there it is. It's moving at the massive rate of 0.15 arc seconds a minute. Um, and uh, it's about 19th magnitude. In fact, it's so far away um, that the main thing that you can see in the astrometry is the parallax effect from one side, observatories one side of the Earth to the other, and that's about one arc second. So if you're observing it on one side of the Earth and somebody else is observing it on the other side of the Earth, 10,000 kilometers away, it makes a difference of about one arc second. That's why we know pretty well that it's about 16 astronomical units away but we don't know much else about it. But anyway, 2017 K2, potentially an interesting comet coming, and in five years' time I'll tell you whether it is or not. Um, other interesting stuff which uh, might be um, of interest to the comet section, but this is actually some work that Richard has done in, in the Asteroid and Remote Planet section on an asteroid called Liperta. Um, this is a light curve, it's a very interesting asteroid, it's got a very slow rotation rate, it's uh, about a 68 day rotation. Uh, and this is work that's been done in ARPS to actually characterise the, the asteroid. The thing that Richard points out that's interesting about this is that there are, there are significant differences between the light curve on one rotation and the next and you could speculate about why that is in, in the email to me Richard you mentioned potentially some residual cometary activity but I think you know who, who knows but as comet section director I'm quite happy to sort of take in all of these objects that used to be boring asteroids and decided that they're going to become comets but if anyone's interested in doing photometry of asteroids it's a, it's a really worthwhile um, thing to do uh, and I'm sure Richard would be very happy to, to help people along with that so finally then, as we approach the morning sky, we're talking about Venus. Um, Venus is low in the east. This is a drawing that um, Paul did of it a few days ago. Uh, definitely worth, uh, if you happen to be up, either up late because you haven't gone to bed or you happen to be up for some other reason, um, having, having a look at Venus because it's a, always an interesting object um, there. So, just a couple of final things um, that are fairly imminent. So this is um, the launch of the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, tomorrow, there's going to be one of these launching the CRS-11, commercial resupply mission that goes to the International Space Station. It's scheduled to be launched at 2155 UT tomorrow. Um, which means that it will actually come over the UK at around 22.17. So it's quite unusual for a launch to actually come over the UK in circumstances where it will be in sunlight, but it's dark enough for us to potentially see it. Um, so this might be worth looking out for tomorrow night if it's clear. Uh, if you look on heavens above um, and look for the ISS pass relative to your location, then what's expected is that the CRS-11 will, will pretty much cross the same path over the sky but will be about 20 minutes before the ISS pass, that is if it gets launched. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth having a, a look at, it'll be much fainter than ISS, I saw ISS the other night and it was like minus, magnitude minus four or something as it went over. Um, CRS-11 is likely to be nearer to magnitude five, so it's more likely to be a binocular object. But what will be interesting is that it will have the second stage of the Falcon 9 rocket very close to it. So if you do manage to see it in binoculars, you may actually see um, two objects traveling close together. Um, this is a, a plot that uh, William Stewart did for me showing it. It's effectively going past Arcturus. This is for Chelmsford actually um, at 2217 tomorrow. But if you look, if you look on heavens above and you look at what the ISS is doing, 
and then subtract 20 minutes from it you, you should be able to get a reasonably good idea of where this track is um, it actually gets launched into a much lower orbit than the ISS because the idea is that in the lower orbit it's going around faster so it gradually catches up ISS and then it will boost itself to dock um, William Stewart pointed out something else which is why I need to put my kind of tinfoil hat on but there's a, a top secret American spy satellite which happens to be in the same orbit as the ISS trailing a little bit behind it and, and lots of people are speculating that this is to actually get high resolution images of the, the birthing of, of CRS-11 and the, the ISS um, so you may see that as well if, if you do a Google search online for ISS and CRS-11 these things will come up you get lots of conspiracy theories as well but uh, there's potentially lots of interesting stuff to see there so that's, that's tomorrow night uh, don't forget the Perseids on August the 12th um, the moon will be a waning gibbous um, but hopefully we'll get some clear skies uh, and get some nice Perseids also this of course I know quite a few people are going to be travelling to Trump land to see the, um, the eclipse in August um, hopefully you'll be able to get in and um, hopefully you'll be allowed, allowed to take your laptop with you um, so I'm going to be in Nebraska which is kind of pretty much where Lincoln is on there but a little bit over uh, a lot of people are going to be sort of Casper Way and over over that way and I know a few people are going to be further over to the, the east but this is going to be a hopefully the weather prospects for this eclipse look pretty good um, so those of you who are making the trip best of luck with the weather and, uh, and the politics don't mention certain things to people in bars um, Jeremy's already mentioned this comment section meeting on June 17th everyone welcome to that if you're interested in comments it's up in Northampton uh, please come along but uh, please let me know first and then finally Richard showed a picture of Bart Bart discovering a comet I, I thought I'd, I'd go one up and show some more frames from that this is, this is from an episode of The Simpsons that anyone who's interested in discovering comets should really watch because I think whilst, whilst it is The Simpsons there was clearly a lot of there was some expert on it who knew quite a lot about astronomy anyway Bart manages to discover a comet God knows how he managed to discover it with a telescope like that uh, which subsequently turns out to be on a collision course with the Earth and uh, this is the simulation of what's going to happen in Springfield when it hits anyway due to a massive problem with scale it actually burns up in the atmosphere in the end but it, it's worth a look anyway so I'll leave you on that if you want to discover comets Richard was talking about all the technical ways I think you should just watch The Simpsons because you probably get just as much <laughs> luck from that thank you very much